We're looking at Contradictions in the Gospels, Part 10. We've been here forever, and we will die in the Gospels. Okay, so Contradictions in the Gospels, Part 10. We don't have screaming children here, which is awesome. We're focusing mainly tonight on uh, more of questions and whatnot. And Isaiah, I thought since last week I said the thing about how we, we will still remember in heaven, I thought, you know, well, I could just say things I've researched, or I could just show you the verses I'm talking about and let you guys decide for yourself. So I've decided to do that. So that will be in with the questions. This <coughs> picture right here, if you look on the screen, this is called the Codex Sinaiticus. Sina <laughs> Sinaiticus. <laughs> okay, so you know Sinai, Mount Sinai? Sinaiticus. Yes. Okay. So this is the Codex Sinaiticus. Okay, so it has extra books in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay. Which are not in our Bible. And it dates to approximately the 300s AD. Okay. It was found in the 1800s. As far as I know, oof, I actually am un I, I'm not sure if this is the original copy or if this is the copy of the Codex Sinaiticus. I think it's the, I think it is the original copy, if I remember correctly, that dates to the 300s. Eesh. You, sometimes you forget these little details. Either way, so it has extra books in both its Old and New Testament that we do not have in our Christian Bible, which makes one think that the church, at least in one place, believed that those books were canonical. We looked at this last week, looking at what books made into the canon and whatnot. So, another little imp important little piece of information is not all the books that are in the Codex Sinaiticus are complete. Like, Genesis, it only has parts of it. doesn't have, I don't think it has any of Exodus. It has a part of Levi uh, Leviticus, and you see what I mean? Part of Joshua, part of Judges, but not complete books. So, why should we not include the extra books from the Codex Sinaiticus into our canon, since this um, is the earliest, I believe, canon, the earliest book of the Christian books put together in one volume. If you know what I'm, you know what I'm trying to say. Okay, since this one is so old, why should we not include the extra books from it? In our canon, how do we know that we got it right when there's this one that's so old that has more books in both its Old and New Testament? Now we looked at the answer last week, but I want to know, want to see if you guys are able to apply what we looked at, because this is something that people bring up to say, well, hey, how do you know that your your canon is right? Because what about the Codex Sinaiticus? So surely, you know, by whose standards is your canon the correct canon? So go, Isaiah. Uh, I was gonna say I was out those here last week. Oh, that's okay. If you don't, if you don't, if you if you don't have any ideas, it's totally fine. Okay, that's fine. Are you, you got anything? Maybe like after like the Bible was. I'm trying to think if like after the Bible was like officially made, maybe that was like kind of like maybe. It was like at, some stuff were like added on or something like that or like. I'm trying to think. Like, did this come before like the Bible was made or? So, um, let me think. I don't remember the exact date when the council ended the, the discussion on which books. I, I don't remember when what the specific date was, and I don't remember what the specific date of the Codex Sinaiticus is. I believe they were both in the 300s, though. So, does that answer your question? Uh, I don't know. Maybe some were just like not really relevant enough. Okay. In it, and like the council decided not to put some stuff in it because it either wasn't relevant or it didn't really talk about <coughs> Really important, important stuff. So they just didn't add it in, or something. Okay. Oh, hold on. So, so what question? Is the question is, how do we know that we got it right as far as what books made it into the canon? How, how, why do we not include the extra books from the Codex Sinaiticus? Well, I, I mean, obviously, I haven't, I haven't read the Codex Sinaiticus or whatever. But maybe some of the, some of the stuff in the Codex in, in that would, would contradict somehow. The rest of you know what we know as the Bible, okay. kind of like the Apocrypha, okay. uh, or um, I don't know the Book of Enoch or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've heard some of the stuff is the Pigrapha and all that. Yeah, all yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, could contradict uh, other aspects of the Scripture. Or whatever. Okay. <clears throat> Nicole. I'm kind of the same thing Eli said, like <coughs> that either it wasn't as important or it just wasn't relevant. Hmm. Okay. Or with what the rest of the Bible was saying. So let me ask you, since this, since you guys both said the thing about it being relevant, let me just kind of 
ask another question before we go to Gracie. Uh, by whose standards relevant? God's standards? Well, how would they have known no. that? Know. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't that have been more of a subjective thing? Or, or are you thinking something more specific? It may have been more subjective. <clears throat> okay, so do you guys have like a rebuttal to that? Or not really? Or I mean, Eli, you got anything? I'm not 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 saying you're wrong. I'm just 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 just, just a prodding question. That's it. Uh, Gracie, you got anything? Uh, I was more uh, thinking on the lines of what Isaiah was saying with contradiction. Um, I was thinking about how Isaiah was saying that God's standards are relevant, but then when I started looking at the Bible, I realized that they were not relevant. Like the Bible is not the only thing that God uses to make it into the Bible. And I was thinking about how Isaiah was saying that God's standards are relevant, but then when I started looking at the Bible, I realized that they did a lot of prayer. They did a lot of fasting and trying to figure out which ones um, they were supposed to be in the Bible. And um, the, I think one of the main things on what to keep out of the Bible was the things that were contradictory to itself. Okay. So are you saying that they had to edit it to make sure that there were no contradictions? Oh, no, I don't think they edited the, what the words down at all, no. I think, though, that they um, – so, like, the books that were written – the closest in time, I think was that was one of the categories. Um, the first person. Um, Shooter. Huh. Shooter. Yeah. The first person and um, um, witness um, bases and um, if it matched up with what the disciples said. And, so the test for canonicity. Huh. It's the test for canonicity. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I I think and then also um, as far as like the Old Testament, the ones you know. That were um, passed down and knew that they were legit. So um, they added them to the council, but they did not grant them the rank of master. Yes. <laughs> That's funny. No, I would I would still probably read I would still probably read the book of Enoch just to see what information I could get out of it and study it. And I'd probably if I could order the codex, whatever you call it. You can. I'd probably read it too, just just for reading. So maybe I could get some wisdom out of it. I don't you can actually get uh, a lot of uh, different books. The what's it called? The uh, wisdom of or the book of Deborah, or whatever. The book of Baruch or something. Wisdom of something. Of I forget all the names right now. Solomon? I forget all the names right now. But either way, um, you, yes, you can. Get, I actually had a professor who had um, them in his office. So uh, I think that their answer is fourfold. First off, the other books were not widely used. Remember, remember your your test of canonicity. We have one codex, yes, that dates to the 300s. It has these extra books in it. Why are those books not in the canon? Because only, as far as we know, only one group, uh, one area had that in their in their list. As far as we know, the Christianity as a whole did not have it. Now you have to remember, by the 300s, the church was all around the Mediterranean Sea. They were in Rome. They were in the Middle East. They were in Africa. They were all over. So you had this whole big section of Christianity, and you're saying because even like let's say all of Africa was using the Codex in it. Just roll with me on this, okay? Let's say that whole area is using the, these books, and only these books, no other books. Well, that doesn't mean that the entirety of the church is. That just means it's real popular in an area. See what I mean? So that's the first thing that needs to be kind of looked at. Is this um, is this um, a Catholic? Are these Catholic books? Are they, are they not Catholic as far as like Roman Catholic? I mean Catholic as far as Catholic means general. Are they generally used in the church? Um, also, were they cited regularly by the church fathers or, you know, so on and so forth to, to somehow make them more, you know, connected or something? No, they, they weren't. As far as we can tell, you know, the Bible, the books that we have in the Bible are the ones that were cited and were used and distributed throughout the ch Christian church. Number two, they didn't agree with the canonical books. That's absolutely true. Um, there's some of them that are just like a little bit, you know, you know what I mean? Just not quite, not quite there, um, and uh, say things that that contradict other parts in scripture. So the, yes, they, they they do not show themselves. So we know right there, okay, whether it made it into the Codex Sinaiticus or not, it shouldn't. That doesn't mean that it should be canon. Number three, their authorship is doubtful. Their authorship is doubtful. This is an, a very important thing that that you had to you had to be one of the eyewitnesses or closely related. Okay, so like Mark was not one of the eyewitnesses. He was not there for Jesus. Okay, but he was recording, it seems, Peter's words, and Peter was one of the twelve. <laughs> he, 
He was, a, but Peter was not a good writer. We know this for fact because when you compare First and Second Peter, First Peter is written very well in Greek. Second Peter is like a child wrote it in Greek. It's t it's like the difference of night and day. Well, the difference being one was written by a fisherman who had no idea what the heck he was doing, and the other one was written by someone who was a very well well instructed uh, writer. Differences, you know, you can tell these kinds of things when you go back to the manuscripts. So when we look at this. Authorship is definitely doubtful on at least a few of the books, if not all of the books. And the, and the fourth answer to this, we don't know if they viewed all the books equally. Just because they have books compiled into one book does not mean that they thought all of these books were scripture. Yeah. They could have just seen them as important books. In fact, in, in early, in early ch uh, church history, we know, we know for fact that there are books that the church saw as important. Not inspired, but very important. Um, I believe um, first and second. Um, the scene, Maccabees. I believe first and second Maccabees were considered a very uh, important uh, Jewish book, and so they were kept as as church books, but not really an inspired book. It, it recorded a lot of history, but not anything that really was inspired by God. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. Right. So. Um, the church as a whole never recognized the other books as canon. That's absolutely true. So even if it was in the Codex Sinaiticus, or even though it was in the Codex Sinaiticus, the church as a whole did not recognize them as canon. Um, just local groups use them, as far as we can tell. There are always sects of Christianity that believe that some books should be added. Always. If you look at, for instance, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, they have their own books that they think are equal with Scripture, right? You know, Pearl of Great Price, or um, you know, different things like that. So they have their own little ideas of, you know. What should be it? And then there's always like those other little remote groups like, oh, I don't go to church, but I think that the Christian Bible is corrupt and it should include these other books in it. There's always going to be sects, you know, that that include books that the whole does not. And then we have something that kind of odd that happened. So the Catholics actually have books in their book that the Protestants don't include. But the thing is, is that as far as we can tell, earliest Christianity did, did not believe that those books were inspired. The Catholics added them afterwards. Um, for their own reasons, which we won't get into today. But um, either way, history is on the Protestant side on that one, not the Catholic side. Um, <clears throat> so some books are important to Christian history, but not equal to Scripture. And not everyone understands that. It's it's hard for a lot of times for people to, to say, okay, so a Christian can value a book without seeing it as inspired. And that's true, but people just don't realize that. So um, let's see. So not uh, so who decided uh, what books to, to be in the Bible? Well, the church as a whole recognized what books. So um, based on based on the the tests of canonicity, who wrote it, how widely it was used, whether it seemed inspired, whether it's connected with the other scriptures, so on and so forth. Um, so the Codex Sinaiticus is important for us. It's something that is a valuable reference for us, but it doesn't mean our canon is wrong. Those other extra other books fell the fell all the tests, and so there's just kind of this red flag that we should say, hey, you know, and, and the thing is people will say things in a very, people think that saying something with passion or when they may, saying it and making fun of you while they say it makes it more true, and it's not. If you'll just stop when somebody's trying to, trying to like degrade you, if you'll just stop and listen to what they're actually saying, you'll usually see the answer. So on that video we watched last, last week for, for uh, Bill Mounts, somebody actually brought the Codex Sinaiticus up, and they were talking about, so by whose, whose standards? You guys are, you, you know, all this different stuff about the canon and how it's, you know, not reliable and all this different stuff. So I thought, hmm, you know, that sounds like a hard question, but the truth is they just twisted the facts to back up what, you know, that the canon was faulty, and it's like, whatever. So let's go to this. Um, our first little contradiction we will look at, since we're about in Matthew 22, 23 anyways, I thought this would be interesting to look at some more of these um, contradictions and the things that Jesus said. So in this one, it sounds like he's saying, don't call somebody a fool or you'll go to hell, and then he calls someone a fool. So let's look at the two passages. The first one is in Matthew 5, 22. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka! is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. You fools and blind men, this is Matthew 23, 17. Which is more important, the gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? 
So it sounds like, once again, that Jesus is contradicting himself. And like I brought up with the whole thing about whether, you know, can, can you have good from your heart? Remember the last thing we looked at? Can he, Jesus said, hey, nobody can be good. Then he said, the good man brings from his heart. And I was like, wait, what? So growing up, I, I remember uh, joking, uh, joking around and calling someone a fool, like as a joke, like, hey, fool. You just like as, as a joke. And uh, it was not well received by some people <laughs> because they, they were all like, hey, Jesus said you're going to go to hell if you call somebody a fool. And once again, see, the problem is in a lot of Christianity, they take Jesus' words hyper literal. I'm not saying that Jesus was wrong or didn't mean what he said, but sometimes people say things in a way that doesn't mean that literally. It means something else. You know what I mean? Like yeah, yeah. you can kind of take somebody's words out of context and say, okay, so this means if you say the word fool, you're going to hell. Well, that's not what he's talking. If you look at the context, but, eh, eh. but like, the, like the whole pluck your eye out. Right. You yeah. Like you don't really – have to right you don't have to do that go do that <laughs> yeah. so um then I, I that's so okay so this kind of caused me a lot of confusion and then right here he says hey you, you fools and it's like oh okay um so you can uh you can do something that we can't huh jesus and so that's actually an important point that a lot of people bring up they say well jesus was above the law he can do what we can't that sounds good that sounds really good but the problem is it's super wrong and the reason why is because then why did he live subject to the law when he was on earth? He came in and subjected himself to the law that he gave. Why did he do that if he was just going to say, I don't have to live by these words? That's a contradiction right there. He came, lived under the law, and then died under the law so that he could set us free from the law. And he ratified, this is what Hebrews says, a new covenant where we do not have to do the old works of the law. How could he have done that if he didn't live under the law? That would have destroyed all of the book of Matthew's point. The whole point of, of the book of Matthew is to show about the law and Jesus. Why would he have done that if it was a moot point because Jesus didn't have to follow the law anyways? That just doesn't make any sense. So so then we, we come to another question. Well, maybe they're different words. Maybe the word translated here as full is a different word than this word here that is translated full. No, they're both moroi. <laughs> What? Moroi. <laughs> so, moron. <laughs> Idiot. Oh, fool. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's the Greek word that is there. It's, in, it's the translated as fool in both both verses. <laughs> it is where we get our word moron. <laughs> and uh, yes, it is the exact same word. So, no, it is not because Jesus was above the law. It was not because there's different words. So, do you guys have any idea as to, to, to what's going on here? Well, first, what is what is Bacchus? Um, well, it's more or less, um, more or less, you idiot. But that's not really what we're looking at. We're looking at fool. So he says here at the end, you fool, and then you don't don't call somebody fool, or you're in danger of hell. But then, in, and here he says, you fools and blind men. So we're looking at the idea of how. You guys got any ideas of how to rectify that? Is it? Not sure. Okay, Eli? Nicole? Crazy? Um, well, seeing how it's Jesus, I bet you he's talking about the heart. Okay, what do you mean? Okay, well, for instance, I tell you, if anybody even lusts after someone else, they commit adultery in their hearts. Okay. You know? So I feel like it's more um, talking about the heart of, you know, if you, it says dangers of a fire belt. So I think he's talking about, you know, if you start, um, you know, saying stuff, it's going to lead you down a path and it's going to make it where it's, you know, you might go to hell because you let one thing slip is going to continue to slip. And I think you're on the right, you're, I think you're on the right, um, the right okay. path. Uh, and the reason is because the, the verse immediately following 22, 21, it says, you have heard it. You know that you should not, you should not commit murder, and so that leads us to this. But I tell you that anyone who is so we know that the context is severe hatred towards somebody, right? We know that that's a context. Whoever murdered somebody, like I love you so much. 
It's like nobody does that. Huh? <laughs> well, yeah, psychos. <laughs> but, uh, anyways, but I tell you, so it's not it's not just don't murder someone. It goes beyond that. So, okay, so how does it go beyond murder? Either you murder someone or you don't mur murder someone. Well, if you're angry with a brother or sister, anger is more of what's in the heart. It's more of a more of a, an attitude, a motive, if you will. You are itching to say something, Nicole. You you go ahead, girl. <laughs> With this, could it be about a foolish heart? About more of... You mean in 2317? Yes. More of having a foolish heart? Now, wh what are you, what's the difference in, in what you're saying between a foolish heart and a foolish person? Having and believing something in your heart, like being very greedy and knowing that you're greedy, but not actually acting greedy... If that makes sense. Not like constantly spending and wanting to buy more, but having greed in your heart versus your action. I guess I'm just not getting not getting what, what you're saying is would be uh, the definition of a foolish heart. Could you try saying it in a different way, maybe? I think what she's trying to say is like foolish heart and, and like belie believing something that's foolish. Like having the Having the audacity. So naive. You're, you're yeah, saying like calling them naive. Yeah. Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's, that's kind of the route I was going yes. down, yeah. Okay. So would there is there a difference between who we are and our heart? Are you saying that there's a difference between like we can be something without actually being it? Like how can we have a foolish heart without being foolish? I guess I didn't think about that. Now, I'm not saying you're wrong. Yeah. I'm just asking for clarity. Maybe... Maybe maybe twenty three seventeen is talking about a foolish heart, but maybe the maybe five twenty two is talking about is talking about like a foolish person or like belitt belittling someone's intelligence, like calling them stupid or like pretty much. How does that? What does that have anything to do with murder? Well, maybe if you hate someone, which is murder, you might you, know, you could call them stupid or. I see what you're saying, but I don't see that in the in the words in in the way that the the translation here. If you go to the Greek, I'm not sure that that is something that fits. It's a good idea, and, and thank you for sharing it. I'm just not sure that it fits in this 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 time. But you said something else when he when he started um, just now saying something. You said something, um, and you were saying oh, about. about 522 being more of a foolish person in general. Okay. Just making, you know, stupid mistakes, having a lot of anger. Just like a generalized foolish okay. person versus in 2317 having a foolish heart. Which that brings us to two different problems that I see with, with, with that. And once again, this might not be wrong. This is just something that problems that I'm seeing. We, we still don't know the difference between a foolish heart and a foolish person. That's the first problem that I see there. The second the second issue is you said in 522 if he's talking about the person being a fool, but that kind of ignores the context of what, what he's talking about. So I'm, I'm not sure if that's going to work. You'd have to work out both those – answer right. both those questions before you were able to say that that – would go that way. So I'm not saying you're wrong. You know, maybe if you maybe if you were able to answer those two questions, you you would you would have more of an argument for that. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, it's more about context being key. Like everything with Greek, it's it, in English we don't understand we don't understand how big a role context is because people English is much more precise and literal. I, I don't know how else to say it than that. And it's more precise and literal than, like, most of the languages I know of. Like, m most of the languages, like, it requires more thought when you speak, and you you're kind of, like, painting a picture. And, like, they'll say things, and you know that they aren't saying – you aren't really interpreting it literal. You just kind of see a picture in your head of, like, what something means. You know what I mean? Like, let's say um, – if I were to say something like um, – Gracie's a, Gracie's a small person. Obviously, a lot of times people are gonna people in, in English are gonna think, okay, she's she's a short person, so you're looking for a short person who could be Gracie. But like, let's say if I'm saying that in another language, maybe they would all maybe they would have this idea of, okay, so small in that context in, in that language, for instance, might mean something more of she's a 
um, immature person or a foolish person, and they would just understand that because in their mind that's how they think. You know what I mean? Like a good example, uh, Song of Solomon. Foxes back then were known uh, for their for their destructive nature. So we read in Song of Solomon, it talks about, you know, beware of the little foxes, and we think of a fox uh, as, you know, this or that or, or whatever, um, do you know what I mean? But we don't really get what he what they're saying, and so we kind of lose some of the context. You guys, you guys kind of yeah. see what I'm saying? Okay. Other languages, it might, the word might have like three different meanings or something. Well, not just not just the very vari variation of the translation of the word that that is true, but also the way that the that the speakers of the language comprehend the language, how they interact with it, like um. You know how when you're tired, here's a good example, when you're tired and you try to read a book that's like very lofty, your brain just can't process it, you know what I mean? English doesn't work like that as a language. It's, it's pretty much a very dumbed down language. Like, it's it's pretty easy to, to carry in a conversation even if you're tired. But there's a lot of other languages where it requires a lot more thought when you're talking. You know what I mean? Like... It, 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 it's more of an expressive language and like more of like I don't know how else to describe it unless you like know the languages you, you kind of poetical not really sort of kind of um Is that my English? no other languages um and so my more of the story being since I can't really think of the words we'll just forego all that and just say this context is key in translation especially with Greek um the the what he's talking about in five he's not er, this this part of five is not just talking about murder. He's talking about what is in our hearts. You've heard it said that it's bad to do the action of murder. Okay, but I'm I'm actually saying that it goes deeper than the action because the action starts with an attitude. And he talks about this later. He says about from from our heart, the word the words come out from from what's inside. We we bring forth treasure from what is inside. So if there's something bad, it comes out. So he's saying here it's, it goes beyond just murder. You can't hate somebody in your heart and then say, hey, but I didn't murder them, so I'm fulfilling the law. The purpose of the law was not just for you to stop killing somebody. It was for you to love somebody. That was the idea behind it. So they didn't understand the intent of the law, but they were still saying, hey, I'm following the law because I haven't murdered this guy that I hate. I hate Eli a bits, but I haven't murdered him, so I'm okay. <laughs> and so Jesus is saying, I tell you, it goes deeper than that. If you're angry with your brother or sister, where it's like, I will not forgive Eli for what he did. I will not forgive him. I am, mm. It's He's not talking about um, getting mad at a moment. You know, like, ah, oh, that kind of irritated me. You know when you're, like, angry. So angry you could spit. Except for girls, because they don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> again, anyone who says to his brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. So, once again, we're talking more of in the context of getting in a fight with somebody. Right? Just because you get in a fight with somebody and you don't, you don't murder them doesn't mean... You're all good. <laughs> if there's ugliness in your heart, God don't love ugly. <laughs> and anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. So we know that we know from the context that he's not saying the words you fool. If you say the words you fool, you're going to be in danger of hell. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about the context of the anger, the fight, the the conflict with other people. God wants us to be at peace with other people. Okay. He doesn't want us to be bad mouthing people behind their backs, but he also doesn't want us to be in fights and in, in conflict with them. And Paul talks about this a lot when he talks about resolving your your your, your conflicts. So all that whew, he's talking about what's in our hearts. Many people pride themselves on how good they are, not realizing that what is inside is liable to judgment too. What is inside our hearts is liable to judgment too. Oh, I, I'm such a good person because I stayed faithful to church. I'm such a good person because I clean the church every week. I'm such a good person because, well, look at me. I volunteer all this stuff. But it's in our it's stuff in our heart that's liable to judgment too. If you're if you're hating somebody, and you, you see people excusing this all the time, it's okay for me to hate my ex-wife because she's my ex-wife, so I can hate her. I can hate her. It's fine. Or I can hate this person because they left the church. So I can hate them, you know, and all these different excuses that we have for hating somebody, and all the all the while, it, what is inside inside is liable to judgment too, not just the stuff that comes out. So if you're harboring secret resentment, God knows, and God was wanting you to go to that person and fix that issue. He's not wanting you to be in conflict with someone whether you think it's secret or not, and that's what this is talking about. And and he goes in other t talking about other spots too, but we'll just kind of move on. Um, so how good are you really? Not just how good do you appear, but how good are you really? And that's the heart of what Jesus is talking about here. Y'all are putting on a real good show, but how good are you really inside? And this is actually the same part where he talks about the whole thing with adultery, where that Gracie brought up. 
Okay, so you've heard it. You've heard about not committing adultery. Hey, good on you, mate. But you know, if you're if you're sitting there like, ooh la la, I mean, that's the same the same situation here, guys. So, um, there are things that are foolish, and by doing them, we make ourselves full. So, a good example of this would be um, giving a false word. When you claim that you have a word from God, that you do not have a word from God, you just make something up, or you just feel something in your heart, and you so you say it, but it has no biblical basis. This is giving a false word. Sometimes people give false words are genuinely convinced that it is a the right word. You can fool yourself. That's totally possible. It's happened in the Bible. It's happened in, in church history. It's happened a lot of different places. So um, a good example of when we make ourselves fools by doing something foolish, giving a false word. Um, have you seen? Have you ever seen that in church? I have. Give I have. Oh, I've I've seen actually seen it a lot. I grew up with it a lot. I tell you what, people would do a lot. If you, I've heard this one a couple times. If you pray for other people to be healed, you will be healed. So my healing is dependent on my good works, not by grace. Okay. Huh. That's interesting. Hmm. That is very interesting. Well, now hold on, James tells us that it's not our faith that brings healing. It's the, it's, it's the faith of the people who are praying for us. It's, it's you know, so there's <laughs> that. So if I, don't, if I don't have faith for my healing, God can still heal me. So that's something that's kind of important there. Um, what else was it talking about? Do you remember what I was talking about? You're talking about false words in the church. Oh, yes, um, false words. And then I'll tell you some other things, false words that people have said. Um, they'll go and they'll say something. God gave me a word to tell you, and they'll say it, and it, it's nonsense. It's like that. What? Here's the thing. When God gives you a word, especially through somebody else, it's something that he's already been talking to your heart about 95% of the time. And even if it's not, it's going to be something that makes some sort of sense. Like somebody walks up to you and, Isaiah, you need to break up with, with that girl. I'm not dating anybody. What the heck are you talking about? <laughs> and so then you say, I'm not dating anybody. And they're like, well, you're dating somebody in your heart. <laughs> what? That's not what you said. <laughs> now you're just trying to cover for your mistake. Anyways, um, another one more recently. Yeah, people do that kind of crap all the time. Uh, in college, I heard people doing this. God told us that we should. God told me that we should be together. Isn't that odd that he didn't tell her? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> You're gonna have my babies, and you know you don't even know. <laughs> okay, well, that's something. Uh, more recent history. Um, a couple of months ago, there were some people who came to came to the church and. This, the, like four or five different people gave a strong word um, that was actually ended up being for them. And uh, so then one of them that, that the word was for, it was a very strong word of warning, they get up and they have the balls, and I do say balls, to stand up in front of the church and then give a word about how everything is fine and God just love and peace and happiness. And I was like, and so I, I, I interrupted them in the middle of that spill and I said, that was a very foolish thing that you just did. God is warning somebody here, trying to trying to say, trying to trying to draw them out of this huge error, and instead you tell them that was a very very foolish thing. You will be subject to God for that one, and I I remember that very very strongly. So yes, that kind of stuff does happen. Anyways, um, so there are foolish things that we can do. Like giving a, giving a false word, that, that's a foolish thing. Whether you're the smartest person in the world, if you do a foolish thing like that, you make yourself a fool. But then there's also foolish people. These are people who habitually are fools. What makes you a habitual fool? Well, Proverbs tells us when you don't listen to advice from other people, when you, when somebody tries to correct you and you won't hear it. No, I know best. I don't have to fall. I don't have to get other people's in, input. I just know everything. I'm going to do this. I'm going to buy this. I'm going to go wherever I want. I'm going to work wherever I want. I'm not going to listen to anybody else's advice because I'm my own person. That's called a fool. Uh, somebody who doesn't live under God's commands, that, that the Bible calls that person a fool. Somebody who denies that God is, is real, that he, the Bible calls that person a fool. So there's kind of two different categories of, of fools. One is somebody who may have at one time not been a fool, but they start doing foolish things, and it, it, their heart goes astray, and they change. And then somebody who refuses to listen to God's word, and so they are uh, foolish. So with that being said, I don't see any biblical warrant for a separation between a foolish heart and a fool. I don't see it. Now, once again, though, I could be persuaded if I if somebody were to show me and answer those two questions and show me biblical proof. I 
I would be I, I could be persuaded. I'm not like hell bent against it. But anyways, um, so some other foolish things: satisfying yourself. Um, so living living like life is just all about you. I have a note here that I don't know what it means. Passage to right. Oh, the passage to the right. Okay, I got it. The passage to the right. That makes more sense. Uh, in the passage to the right, Matthew twenty three seventeen, that's actually what they're doing. They're talking about satisfying yourself rather than you know honoring God's commands and and, and loving people and that kind of stuff. Hey, you fools and blind men. So, anyways, uh, denying God, so on and so forth. So there is a difference between speaking in anger. Ephesians says, "Be angry and do not sin." And saying something passionately. So you can say something passionately that doesn't mean that you're that you're, that you're angry. It doesn't mean that you're saying something angry. What's the difference? Well, if your temperature is, is rising, your face is red, your heart rate increases, your blood pressure goes up, these are typical signs that you're speaking in anger. Saying something passionately is more of... Let's say I'm talking to my son. Micah, why did you throw that away? I needed that. I'm not. I'm not mad at him. Like I'm not like. I'm not gonna kill him. Like calm down. You know. I, I'm. 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 I, I. I genuinely feel about the situation that we're, that we're dealing with. I'm not talking down to him. I'm not beating him. I'm not hating him. I'm not. When in my in my heart, I'm not like I'll never forgive him for this. Like yeah. I'll probably be over it in five minutes. See what I mean? There's a difference between. Speaking in anger and saying something passionately. So the context is obviously on anger towards someone, and he, so we're not talking about ta we're not talking about having a a disagreement with somebody. We're talking about ang ang anger, so hatred in your heart. So the the context of the passage in Matthew five twenty two, it's on it's anger towards someone, and even if it doesn't result in murder, that doesn't mean we didn't wish them dead or say something or do something or think something evil. Um, and you guys know this. You guys know your own heart. Proverbs tells us this, you know, um, that f f strangers won't, won't, won't share in the secrets of our heart. You, you know you know your own heart about the way that it, if, if you have an attitude problem towards somebody, you know it. Like, you may lie to yourself. Oh, no, it's okay. Oh, well, they're the one who started it. Oh, they're, they, they're the ones who need to say sorry. But if you stop excusing it, you, you know in your heart, ah, oh, I've got an attitude problem and I need to change you know, it's just something that you can't really hide from yourself. Um, you will be responsible for what you say. The Bible does say that. Not just the things you don't do. A lot of times people do this. I'm doing pretty good because I didn't murder them. <laughs> I'm doing pretty good because I didn't punch them in the face. But, see, it's not just about what you didn't do. You will be responsible for what you did do, for what you did say, for what is in your heart. And we think, oh, no, I can hide it, and, and, and that's totally fine. God knows the secrets of our hearts. <laughs> okay, you can't hide. You can't hide a bad attitude from God. It's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you hate someone, and I had no idea. In fact, this is something that that, that is just blows my mind. God says that He will not forgive for what you do, based on you not forgiving in your heart for what's inside. That's amazing. That He not only does He see what's inside, but we are held responsible for that too. So. Um, so just another note I, I, I wrote here I'll go down through it real quick why did Jesus live under the law well to fulfill it and to prove himself faultless since to obey and disobey the law after he put it in effect would be sin but Jesus was sinless and it's not an issue of whether he could have but whether he would have so not an issue of could Jesus have not followed the law for, for this for this calling somebody a fool? It's more of an issue of would he have? Would he have broken the law on purpose to prove a point? No, no, he would not have. So then you might say, well, what about the Sabbath? If you remember, he actually didn't break the Sabbath. He followed the intent of the Sabbath. He didn't follow their traditions on the Sabbath. There's a big difference there. So he did still heal. That was not against the law. And he did allow his, his his disciples to go and pick the heads of, of grain to eat them while they were walking. That wasn't against the law. It was against their traditions. So with that being said, I think that, that kind of covers that. So will we, remember, will we remember this life and the next life? This is a very um, difficult subject, and a lot of people have a hard time with 
issues in this life, and it's hard to imagine ever being able to be happy when you've gone through some of the stuff in this life. And so this is something that I spent a good deal of time studying, and I'm not going to reveal to you all my studies because I don't want you guys to come to my conclusion. I want you guys to see what I based it on myself. So, he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. This is Luke 16. The, the story is in 19 through 31. It's the story of a rich guy and a poor guy, Lazarus. And they both die. Lazarus was, was extremely wealthy. And I'm sorry, the rich guy was extremely wealthy. Lazarus was, was extremely poor. And they both die. Lazarus ends up in heaven. And the, um, the rich man ends up in hell. And so he's, he, he sees a cross, Abraham in heaven, and he's asking for Lazarus, uh, for him to send Lazarus just to dip his finger in, in the water and, and cool his tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. So first off, he, he recognized who Abraham was, even though he'd never seen him. Second off, he recognized Lazarus. Lazarus. Third off, he had presence of mind to ask Abraham to send Lazarus as a servant to him. See that? Lazarus didn't do anything wrong, and yet he's still expecting Lazarus to be his servant, even in hell. Okay, so let's let's keep going. Um, but Abraham replied, son, remember, remember that in your lifetime, this is something he's able to remember from his lifetime. Okay, so there's a fourth point. In your lifetime, you received good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. He had complete memory of the, of, of the event, of what happened. Okay. So you could say, well, that's in hell. What about heaven? Well, hold on. Uh, Revelation 6, 9 through 10. I saw under the altar the souls, all the under the altar, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony they had upheld. And they cried out in a loud voice, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you avenge our blood and judge those who dwell upon the earth? Showing that they did, that they did actually remember what had happened, and they were still pleading for God to bring justice. How could they have pled for God to bring justice if they didn't have any memory of the of the corrupt thing having happened. How could they be pleading and saying how long? They wouldn't even know that God was postponing it because they would have just forgotten everything. So in heaven, people will also still have memory. Now hold on, that's not the end of the end of the question. So let's keep going. Revelation twenty one four. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, implying that they had been crying, implying that he brought healing, implying that he brought peace, not implying that they forgot. Like why am I crying? <laughs> <laughs> there, I'm sorry, I, I, meant, I meant that as a joke, but it was funnier after I said it than, than I realized it was. Anyways, there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. The way things used to be, that's not how they are anymore. You are. This is Revelation 4.11. You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things. And they exist because you created what you please. This also seems to imply that People are worshiping Jesus in heaven for what he's done, meaning that they actually know what he's done, meaning that there is some memory of what he has done, meaning they did not forget. See what I mean? If, if you just follow the, the, the flow of reasoning, it, it seems fairly obvious that we won't just suddenly forget just because we're in heaven. And then that brings us to Isaiah 65, 17, not this Isaiah. <laughs> oh, I always turn my head. <laughs> the biblical Isaiah. <laughs> Isaiah 65, 17. Now, I hate the NLT. But I, I use the NLT because I think that it really got the, con, the the idea of what's being said. Look, I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will even think about the old ones anymore. I don't think he's saying that we will forget what was before. I think he'll say, he's saying that it's so good that it will it will blow us away. It, it won't even compare. We won't be comparing it to the past. Like, we used to have it so good. I, we're not going to do that. Or, you know, thinking back and remembering, man, I missed the good old days back when, you know, we had jams over at Michael's house. I, that's not going to be a thing. It's going to be so much better, better than we can hope and imagine. It's just going to be so – and so what other translations do, and I don't think it's wrong. I just think that we miss some of what is being said because we take it, once again, hyper-literal when Hebrew – the Hebrew people were not hyper-literal people. I am creating new heavens and a new earth, and no one will – um and the former things will not come to mind. That does not mean that they can't come to mind. That means that they, they won't be something that people are saying, man, I should remember that. We won't long for them. We won't long. There's a good – there's a great way of saying it. Yes, we won't long for them. So that brings us to a very important point. When is the resurrection? This is something that people miss. They think we die, we go to heaven, end of story. <clears throat> the heaven that is heaven now will be done away with. It will be destroyed. It will be destroyed there'll be a new heaven and a new earth okay that's what isaiah is talking about 
in, in 65. So, we go to heaven when we die. Yes. But you are not resurrected when you die. Okay? You go to heaven in an unresurrected body. Okay? So, either this looks like maybe you're floating. I don't know. Maybe you're like, you're dead to corpsifying, but I don't know. I, I don't know what it's going to look like. Either way, you don't have the resurrected body at this point. But, and so, okay, th that heaven passes away. And then there's a new heaven and a new earth that God creates. And um, then at this point is the resurrection, okay? At, at the end, so there's like the rapture, you know, where, where people are brought up, from, the dead bodies are raised. The dead in Christ are raised first. Then those who are still alive are, are, are raised up. Then we're given the resurrected body. There's one your lawn, there's a body. <laughs> <laughs> that really was, that wasn't a fake skeleton. It wasn't a Halloween prank. prank. So anyways, and, and then we're given the resurrected body. And our resurrected body, as far as I can understand, we, we will still be human. We will not have our failures and flaws. We, we, we will not have um, what people call primal urges. So like, for instance, um, when you get really mad and you just want to punch somebody in the face, it's not going to happen in your resurrected body. Okay? Um, <laughs> right? Uh, it won't be subject to the weaknesses. So like when you run, you won't get tired. That's part of the resurrection as well. Forever. Right, that kind of stuff. It's it's more of everything that the Garden of Eden could have been, but better. Well, some people be like unshaped, like they were fat down here, but like would they, would they... You know, I don't know if, if that's actually something that's that's clarified, but I'm assuming that the resurrected body would not be obese because obese is, is for your body to have health issues, and we won't be eating or overeating in heaven. So I don't really see. The re or actually, we might be eating in heaven because it talks about the way that the tree will be reestablished. We will be because I was told all my life as a kid that when you're in heaven, you go boom and you have a hamburger and then you can eat that hamburger. <laughs> yeah, that was and more <laughs> that was more wishful thinking than anything. But somebody over here was gonna say something. No, I well, you. I don't think we'll need to eat, but we'll probably want to eat or whatever. For I don't know. Like wait, is like a reaction here? Just me chilling. Well, the Bible tells us a few things about the, about the time of the resurrection. First off, it tells us that we will have things to do. We won't just be bored. Second off, um, we will be content and fulfilled. So there's that. You won't like, oh, I'm, I'm bored. <laughs> Give me a good book. <laughs> um, the next thing is um, it tells us – it slipped my mind. But so that, that either way, that should give you some kind of a starter on, on what it looks like. But it doesn't give us it doesn't answer all the questions. So there is that. Um, okay. So if we forget our life, we will not be able to worship what the Lamb did. And I think that for all of eternity we will be remembering just how good he did. In fact, I think we'll see it with clearer eyes because I think we'll be able to look back and see the bigger picture of what God was doing and all these different things. And we just saw this little picture of hurt, but we didn't understand all these other connections and, and webs that, that, that God had going on. And, and it'll all make sense and it'll all be beautiful, I think. And we'll say, hey, even even that time that that, that person died, you know, th this bigger thing happened and it was just it was just so much better than I could even imagine. I think it's going to be something like that, but I could be wrong. Because we'll... Um, Okay, so the passage in Isaiah, I already talked about it's the only one it could be used to say we forget. Okay, I already talked about that. Um, so every day will be better than the day before, and it will be so good, we won't miss how things used to be. We'll be have a resurrected body, which will be whole. We will see the pic the bigger picture. I like to think of um, the last battle, the, the last book of the Chronicles of Narnia, where he talks about further up, further in. You know how they keep going deeper in, and it keeps getting better. And it, you know, it, 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 the deeper in they go, like the more there is to it. You know what I mean? And and just one of those things where it it never gets old, but it always keeps getting newer and newer. And it's just one of those things where. I, 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 no, I, he he explained he said it in a way that I thought was really good. Um, C.S. Lewis. So if you're interested in that, you can read the last book and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um. So the passage in Isaiah is either being poetical or overly expressive, not literal. Okay, all right, I already said all that. So, anyways, is fire always a judgment? This is when I hear quite a lot, and we actually passed by it already in Matthew chapter three. It's in verse eleven. Um, John the Baptist is talking about 
the baptism that he brings versus the baptism that Christ brings. And he talks about the way, he, well, he says right here, he says, I baptize you with, with water for repentance, but he who is coming, Jesus, after me is mightier than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now, he talks about the way that he's going to separate the, 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 you know, what's it called? The, the thresh, the threshing, um, the, the threshing floor, he'll separate the wheat from the shaft. That's shaft, that's what it's called. And he'll burn the shaft up. Okay, so the shaft is like the, the unusable stuff. It's like the, the, the waste of it. And um, so that's what he's talking about when he says, I baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So that's caused a lot of people, specifically Baptist, to claim that judgment that fire is always judgment, so it doesn't make sense for Pentecostals and Charismatics to say, Lord, send your fire. Well, so I thought it would be a good idea if we actually looked at this. So is fire always judgment? Well, here's here's 1 Peter 4.12. Um, I think it's 1 Peter 4.12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fire trial when it comes upon you to test you. I will put this um, – I will put this um, – sorry, stop right there. That's 1 Peter 4.12. So fire in this context is not fire so much as uh, judgment and, and wrath. It's trials and persecution. So we know that right there, it's not always judgment. So now let's look at some more examples of, of fire. This next one is from Zechariah 13.9, but you could also compare it with 1 Peter 1.7, Isaiah 48.10, or Malachi 3.3. 3. I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. In this context, fire is a process of God growing our faith, which is a good thing. So for God to send his fire on you would be his, his testing the impurities of your heart. Another way of saying this would be God disciplining those who he loves. He brings by a difficult situation. It stretches you farther than you can go. You feel like you're going to break. You do break. God brings you to another level of faith. Okay, but then that's not the only examples of fire. In Acts chapter 2, which is the context that Pentecostals use it in, the church is gathered together, waiting in Jerusalem, just like Jesus said, and Fire, tongues of fire settled down on the people there who are praying, and they are filled with the Holy Spirit, and they speak in tongues. So in this context, which is the context that Pentecostals and Charismatics use it in, Lord send your fire, they're talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit, being equipped to love and serve people, being fi given the words to say, and experiencing God in a more real way than you have before. And that's how Pentecostals and Charismatics use it. So, final point, Baptists are super wrong. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit just said, okay, I already said that. Okay, so sorry this lesson went this long. It was not meant to go this long. Sorry about that. Any questions or comments? Nicole, looks like you're itching. Um, not literally. Can't fire, <laughs> can't fire in that context be also translated as like passion in a way? Um, well, I, I, I don't think you mean translated because we're not no, we're translating not the words from another language. Right. You mean can, change. right? So can it have can it have well, a wider well, meaning? Yes, yes, it could. Okay. Yes, it could. You could say, um, y yeah, um, give me a fire for you. Yes, you, you could in some context. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, but moral of the story being, when charismatic sing a song about God saying his fire, they're not saying burn me up and consume me with your wrath. <laughs> <laughs> judge me as a sinner and destroy me <laughs> that's not what they're saying <laughs> so okay uh any questions or comments about the lesson no